Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. So in the last week or so, XRP did drop from 62 cents to 41 cents, and crypto whales took notice. This one coming from Ali Charts, guys. They've bought over 31 million XRP in just the past week. So take a look at this. We've got supply here, 10 million to 100 million coins. This is the number of wallets uh, depicted here over the last, uh, well, since April 7th, roughly. You guys can see that number has steadily gone up as the price of XRP has declined. So the price of XRP denoted here in black. And uh, we're in this level here where uh, it's pretty attractive to purchase XRP. Anything under 50 cents at this point in time, April 2024, it's looking as though whales are buying up. And uh, we know these are whales. We know this is not retail because the quantities here, guys, this is a minimum 10 million XRP to a maximum of 100 million XRP. That number specifically did rise. So we're seeing the whales accumulating XRP. That is positive news. Santimate here also bringing this to our attention. Okay, the price of XRP has jumped ahead of the altcoin pack, jumping 6% and as high as 56.8 today. Now, I do believe it actually did go uh, a little bit higher than that. Uh, and this was posted yesterday. The amount of wallets, 2013, holding at least 1 million XRP has been surging over the past six weeks, rising 3.1% and is within one wallet of its all-time high. And here's the sentiment numbers, guys. You can see back in June of 2023, 2014 XRP wallets did hold over 1 million XRP. So that was at an all-time high at that time. Uh, and so that was uh, right before the uh, the announcement from Judge Annalisa Torres that XRP was not deemed a security. That number obviously did go down. But guys, take a look at that. That metric is up again, up to 2013. So within one wallet of its all-time high of investors holding over 1 million XRP tokens. So as price goes down, we're seeing sentiment obviously ramp up for XRP. As I was uh, just mentioning there, it did, uh, well, as the article was mentioning, uh, they were talking about a price of 56.6, I believe. Uh, but you guys can see in there, we did wick up past 56 cents, actually, uh, getting up to a high of about 57, so just over 57 cents. As of the time of this recording, though, we have dipped down a little bit. Now we're back uh, in and around 54 and a half cents. So on the micro trend, we're actually uh, moving up. It's looking quite positive, guys, for XRP. And all the metrics, too, are also uh, just pointing to the fact that this is, uh, well, really good time to be accumulating XRP, guys. We've got greed. That is now at 65. So that is slowly mounting, too. The market cap is at $2.43 trillion for crypto. 24-hour uh, volume is up uh, a little bit. We haven't really seen uh, trading volume really kind of explode yet, and that is uh, apparent in the Bitcoin price. Dominance, too, for Bitcoin is um, just kind of hanging on, 53.6%. And as you guys can see, that is being reflected in the 24-hour price change. We haven't seen uh, too much in terms of price change. Bitcoin's up a little bit. Ethereum's down a little bit. Uh, and most of the other altcoins are pretty much just either up or down by, uh, well, a little bit, not too much activity in the space. We've got XRP though, that is up 2.34% in the last 24 hours and 12.07% in the last seven days. So as these analysts were saying, XRP price movement has been moving up more so than the rest of the altcoin market. Take note, this is again par for the course. Guys, this is typical for XRP. This always happens, or at least, uh, well, I've noticed this uh, having experience with XRP over the last six years or so. It moves in this very, very annoying way up until a point, and then it just explodes, surprising all of us XRP holders, and then the excitement ensues. So that's what we've got for XRP. What are we looking at for BTC? Let's take a look at Bitcoin, guys, right now on the daily. Bitcoin, uh, well, it was up a little bit, coming back out of this rut here. Uh, luckily, we did get back out of this level of support. And now we got to break through. I mean, this is the first level we got to break through, which would be about 72,700. Uh, and Bitcoin's on its way up. And then uh, obviously then at that point, it's all time high. If we can break up above $74,000, uh, well, that'll be the next leg of the bull run. And uh, at that point in time, we'd be going parabolic or at least beginning to go parabolic, I would hope. So right now we're just kind of trading in this range here. Uh, nothing too exciting. Again, we've seen this trading range now since uh, since about late February, early March 2024. But at least it is ranging and it's not doing this, right? Going further down this range too, you can kind of formulate what is a bullish pennant pattern, although I would not call it that. Uh, just ranging pretty much just trading sideways. And uh, as of the time of this recording, we're seeing a Bitcoin trading at around 66,200. I think I said that. <laughs> 66,200 for a BTC. Yesterday, it did get up past $67,000. So 
you know, we're just hoping that this uh, that this bullish pattern continues. Still a bit of a wait and see in the crypto space, unfortunately. Uh, but for the first time ever, the available Bitcoin supply has decreased to about 4.6 million BTC before the halving cycle even began. This is another one from Ali Charts. Why does this matter, guys? The halving further slashes minor rewards, accelerating the scarcity of new Bitcoin as supply tightens. And even if demand remains the same, we can expect a significant impact on prices. So the halving is a bit of a twofold thing. Generally, what we see is price not really do too much directly before or after the halving. And, you know, in fact, what we tend to see is Bitcoin price actually move down after the halving. Uh, and so this is what we're seeing now, supply decreasing to about 4.6 million BTC before the halving cycle began. Now that miner rewards have been slashed, well, it has to be profitable. Otherwise, the miners are selling off. And this is exactly what's happening now. Uh, and this is why we're seeing the sell off, because the miners, they have to sell off to remain profitable because the reward has just been cut in half. But as soon as those Bitcoins get up above that critical level, miners won't be selling off anymore. In fact, they'll be mining Bitcoin and selling them at higher prices to remain profitable. So that is in uh, theory and uh, well, in practicality, because we've seen it in the past, what uh, gets Bitcoin prices up even higher. Anthony Pompliano with a little bit more of an explanation on that. He was just on Bloomberg TV the other day. Listen to this. What was it last week or a week and a half ago? We were down around 60,000. You get a nice bump back up. 66,000 today, Shanali. 66,000, but still off those highs. Let's take that contrarian view too. Taking a look at Bitcoin climbing, following the weekends, having, remember the having cuts the number of Bitcoin produced daily in half. We're going to discuss that more with Pomp Investments founder, Anthony Pompliano. And I think you sit here on a Monday Monday, calm after the storm, and you wonder, did it did it work? I mean, the having worked, but did it really create that catalyst for crypto that everyone expected? Yeah, one of the things that everyone wants to see is like the having occurs and a minute later, all of a sudden the price goes up or down or sideways, what's going to occur? But what we've seen historically is that the having does take some time to kind of work in. Um, there was great research that came out of Bitwise, and what they showed was in the month before the having, the average return over the last couple of bull markets has been 19%. In the month after the having, it's been one6 Seven percent. So you'd say, oh, if I look at it as a 30 day before, 30 day after, it doesn't really matter. But if you actually look at it over a longer time frame, let's say 12 months or 18 months, the having has marked a point where then we go up. And so it's just classic economics 101, right? If demand stays the same and you take away half of the incoming supply, the price has to adjust up or down to accommodate everyone. I think that this time won't be any different. You have to wonder how long the having kind of works as a monetary theory, if you will, and a way to control the supply of Bitcoin, to your point, if demand stays the same, but at what point do you know that demand will continue at the same pace that it has? We've already seen a lot of those flows into the ETF start to moderate. Yeah, what's interesting is that Bitcoin, actually, the demand in terms of aggregate dollars is actually going up. And so what you would look at is you say, oh, there's lots of people who already own Bitcoin. Who else is going to buy Bitcoin? Well, the biggest pools of capital are still left. And so if you look at some of these large sovereign wealth funds, etc., uh, the ETFs introduce a way for them to actually get price exposure without taking control of the Bitcoin. So you can imagine there's certain countries around the world that have all of a sudden they were buying Bitcoin, taking self-custody. People would be asking some questions. Why are you doing that, right? Why are you taking your central bank reserves and getting it out of uh, these other assets that the U.S. likes you to have it in? And so I do think that the ETFs will allow that price exposure. There are sovereign wealths that are going to go ahead and allocate to it. The question is just how much higher will Bitcoin go in this bull market? And that's what everyone's trying to figure out. So I'm going to leave it there. I mean, uh, a lot of interesting insight from Anthony Pompliano. If countries are, in fact, investing in Bitcoin and, uh, you know, reallocating their funds, uh, this is going to mean a spike of Bitcoin demand. Of course, this is still just the beginning. Guys, we still have a lot of bull run to go. And uh, to be honest, I think uh, arguably this is uh, probably the most exciting part of the bull run, the euphoria, the excitement. So I wanted to thank uh, Ali Charts. Of course, uh, Santiman and Anthony Pompliano for those last tweets. Now, the U.S. is getting crypto crazy, or at least presidential candidate RFK Jr. He's trying to get the crowds riled up, saying he will put the entire U.S. budget on the blockchain if he is elected in 2024. I mean, his chances of getting elected are well, pretty low, but I love his ideas. Listen to this.
I'm kind of with JTR down here. The election needs to be conducted on the blockchain. Too easy to get verifiable results. And, uh, you know, I still don't understand why voting isn't done on the blockchain yet. Well, probably because there are some parties involved that like to, well, I don't know, maybe kind of sway the results one way or the other. But I mean, you know, it's it's common sense. Uh, you know, if you want verifiable, uh, real hard, solid results without any tampering, you use the blockchain and then, well, it's unquestionable. The other thing that uh, I've had conversations about was this idea that why do you even have to have a political party if you can vote on the blockchain? Why can't uh, you know, political candidates just put up their platform and, uh, you know, you look at what platform you like and you vote on the things that you want. It could be that, you know, you get 30% of uh, one party's platform and then 60% of another party's platform and then 10% of another party's platform and kind of mix and match all the best policies that people vote on individually. And guys, all that can be done on the blockchain. You don't even need government. Oh, you wouldn't need a government. Hmm. Yeah, I'm sure they'll really be clamoring at going for that. I guess I just answered my own question there. Anyway, Alex Finn here on Twitter, guys. Breaking X has now acquired a new money transmitter license in half the U.S. states. This is a life-changing opportunity for X creators. Monetization is coming and it'll create millionaires. No platform will pay creators more than the X platform. And so, guys, here's just a, a map of all the money licenses now. I think uh, Tennessee was the most recent one that Elon Musk has secured on the X platform. But all the money licenses now in the United States that X has now received. So... That is going to be very interesting. Recently, I did a video on uh, the Elon Musk X connection and how there are ties to Ripple and XRP, Chris Larson, former companies that uh, both Chris and Elon Musk worked for, and Peter Thiel too. Elon Musk potentially having 17 million XRP in a wallet. If you guys didn't catch the most recent update I did on that, I will link it up here in the top right-hand corner. And so, you know, I'm happy I'm seeing this. The US really does have to catch up when it comes to this technology. Considering, you know, at every turn, it seems as though something, uh, well, shady is happening at the government level, guys. A federal judge has now just sanctioned the SEC for gross abuse of power in handling the debt box crypto case, criticizing the agency's actions for undermining judicial integrity with false statements and misrepresentation. So... This is the latest SEC lawyers Michael Welsh and Joseph Watkins have now resigned after being informed that they would be fired over their handling of the case, which involves accusations of a $49 million fraud by Digital Licensing Inc. So this is the most recent uh, boondoggle, I guess we could call it, for lack of a better term, by the SEC. The regulator's lawsuit against Debtbox was marred by false statements and misrepresentations, as well as lack of evidence, according to Robert Shelby. He was the judge in the matter. Shelby took the extreme step of sanctioning the agency for abuse of power in March, and the SEC's head of enforcement has apologized for the missteps. Neither Welsh nor Watkins, who were based out of the regulator's Salt Lake City office, responded to phone calls and questions and comments. The SEC declined to comment as a representative of the union representing the agency staff. Uh, in July, the SEC accused Debtbox and its executives of defrauding investors of at least $49 million. At the regulator's request, Shelby froze the company's assets and put the firm into receivership. But here's what happened. The asset freeze was eventually reversed after Shelby found that the SEC may have made materially false and misleading representations. The judge would go on to sanction the SEC for gross abuse of power uh, entrusted to it by Congress and ordered the agency to pay some of Debtbox's attorney fees. Ouch, this is just not good. And, uh, you know, just uh, again, another example why we need a reformed government agency uh, to be doing this. You know, this is not a bipartisan issue. Cryptocurrency regulation, clarity, it's going to benefit everybody. Eleanor Turd here also commenting, according to their LinkedIn profiles, Welsh and Watkins both had only one and a half years experience at the SEC before the resignations. Prior to their SEC appointments, Welsh was working for Cooley's and Watkins for Par uh, Parsons, Bale, and Latimer. Interesting side note, though, while at Cooley's, Welsh helped represent crypto company Kick in its lawsuit brought by the SEC in 2019 under Chairman Clayton. The other piece of news that we recently just received was this, courtesy of DJ Peter Vass. Ripple has now finally come out with their retort to the SEC and seeks to pay only $10 million in a civil penalty for its securities law violation, arguing that the SEC failed to demonstrate why an injunction and disgorgement is warranted. Uh, we've got James K. Filan coming out with the judgment here. And even Brad Garlinghouse says, you know, it feels apropos that we filed our response on the same day that the two SEC lawyers resigned for their misconduct in the debt box case debt box case, excuse me, the U.S. will be picking up the pieces of the agency's disastrous policies long after Gensler is gone. 
Uh, so here we go, guys. Ripple is saying, uh, you know, we're not paying $1.9 billion, but we'll agree to pay less than $10 million. So lots of talk about Ripple's response, uh, but this will catch attention. This one coming from the Wrath of Kahneman. Ripple's remaining ODL business in the United States uses a non-XRP bridge currency. So guys, maybe we've got some answers now and more information on the stable coin. Let's take a look at this response though. So the James K. Filen post uh, just states that Ripple has filed a motion to strike new expert materials the SEC submitted in support of its motion for remedies and entry to final judgment. 24 Hours Crypto here uh, decided to summarize this for us. Ripple contends that the SEC introduced new expert materials, including a declaration and related exhibits from the new expert witness named Andrea Fox after the discovery deadline had passed. Uh, Ripple asserts that this late submission violates the agreed upon schedule for the rules, which are designed to prevent one side from gaining an unfair advantage, of course. And Ripple is requesting the court to exclude the SEC's late disclosed expert materials to maintain the procedural fairness of the case and to prevent any undue advantage that may arise from the SEC's late disclosure. In other words, Ripple will get this. I'm 99% sure she will strike this. So, uh, you know, the SEC trying to ask for more and uh, Ripple's just not having it. Uh, when it comes to the actual lawsuit itself, Anders here posting this, everything points to the lawsuit being a weapon, in my opinion. Even John Deaton was saying that, that it was Occam's razor. The motive, super obvious, Ripple created a product to replace correspondent banking, which is a huge cash cow for a few mega global uh, correspondent banks. Not only that, it's an overall innovation to democratize finance, correspondent banking just being the first step, hugely removing the barriers of entry and a way for smaller players to offer a new financial service to customers. Nightmare fueled for JPM and uh, Citibank, uh, just as two examples there, not only because of their lower barriers of entry, but because huge banking organizations move very slowly with improving their tech. I've heard of uh, banks taking five to 10 years just to update their internal IT systems. Hard to keep up with new innovative technology. This is also supported by the statement uh, made by both Garlinghouse and David Schwartz. Garlinghouse saying that 99% of banks want to see us succeed and 1% being the correspondent banks. Guys, I remember this from 2018. I just didn't understand the magnitude of it uh, really until the lawsuit came about. 1% of the banks, uh, sorry, making a lot of money because of the current system. Those are the banks that want to see uh, Ripple fail. Schwartz was saying that if you're at the top, you wish to stay there and put a stop to innovation. Also fully in line with us, Garlinghouse saying that uh, we're both competing with Swift and Citi. With Citi, he's clarifying that they're competing with liquidity. Ashish Birla uh, saying that Citi would also be the last customer they would sign, uh, telling a story of how City told them that they are their enemy at the meeting that they had and asked why they would help them out and many more <laughs> statements. So this is the kind of, you know, atmosphere we're working in here. Whether people, and I love this, I love that Anders is bringing this up, whether people believe in Bearable Guy or not, even that cartoon guy has said from the beginning that the king is using regulations to slow the progress of Ripple. Bearable Guy has said it, guys, from the beginning. He even said that Gensler is the king's old guard. Uh, that he was saying way back in 2018. Hate him or love him. The first to say it. So even the Riddler should support that theory, but wishful thinking probably prevents it. I'm also going to go over Fred Rispoli's interpretation, guys, because there are some signs here suggesting what could happen next and how that could affect XRP. Fred Rispoli here. Here's my hot take on Ripple's opposition to Remedy Motion. Uh, so he's saying anything above 10 million would be unfair and inappropriate. And this is why Ripple, uh, you know, did just put that in there uh, as their last line in their brief. Uh, first, as predicted, Ripple has changed its operations to account for the court ruling. So guys, this is something that now we're seeing. It's keeping all its major ODL offshore, mainly in Singapore. Judge Torres, in my opinion, will not get into a factual fight on an incomplete record. So Ripple wins because the SEC can't carry its burden. Interestingly, and possibly sadly, for United States, US ODL, we have confirmation why Ripple decided to issue a stable coin. So guys, it's possibly looking like maybe Ripple, at least as of now in the short term, created the stable coin or will be using this uh, US denominated stable coin in the United States only for the purposes of transmitting liquidity, at least in the interim until things get sorted. Maybe that will change down the road. Also great to see Ripple shove the SEC statement about losing in their face. So this is a lengthy declaration from Monica Long that reveals some interesting business practices like stopping institutional sales in 2019. Ripple is aiming for uh, money transmitter licenses in 45 states and changing ODL contracts. Lots more to dive into here, and I still need to. The bad news, the parties are teeing up, okay, or posturing. Round two, Ripple tells the court if the SEC 
wants to sue on new contracts. It needs to bring new enforcement action. The SEC getting hammered with a low penalty will help in dissuading a repeat enforcement action. So that's uh, at least positive. And I was right, says Fred Rispoli. Ripple did throw in the debt box case, not incredibly relevant, but if the SEC wanted to throw X posts in the judge's face, then Ripple will be one-upping them with throwing job-ending sanctions out there. The number of characters redacted on page 23 are 11 and 12, meaning less than $9 million at most. This is where Ripple got its $10 million number from. Uh, and SEC uh, has the gall to ask for $2 billion when it only sanctions its boys a couple of milli. Not going to persuade Judge Torres here, SEC, says Fred Raspoli. So how is this going to affect XRP utility in the United States? And will this affect XRP utility for the long term, guys? Should you be XRP saying here, uh, every transaction on the XRPL uses XRP and the stablecoin would have to use XRP to move? Fred Rispoli saying yes, but Ripple also stated that it intends on issuing the stablecoin on Ethereum. So now I assume the Ripple Ethereum stablecoin will be for US-based customers to be safe, at least in the interim, guys. I think this is just so Ripple can get this moving right away in the United States, considering we are getting stablecoin regulatory clarity. But digital assets will see more clarity as we move into the coming months and possibly years. That's not to say XRP won't pump in the meantime, but that's just my opinion. I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.